Hi, I'm Chase Bishop, the writer and artist of my comic series, Exes from Paradise. You can get most of my links from either Instagram or Twitter, which both share the username underscore Chaz underscore Bernard underscore. And you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator and artist. He is, of course... The creator of Exodus from Paradise, a brand new series that I just happened upon recently. And he has volume one currently out. He has also worked on the Fugitive Poems, Containment Breach, volume three, as an artist for a story. And check back on the Fugitive Poems interview if you haven't had a chance on the show earlier this year as well. Joined by the ever-talented Chase Bishop. How are you doing today? I am doing good. It's uh, a little early over here. (laughs) For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am a writer and artist. I do most of my own things since I haven't really had the chance to uh, work for other people besides Fugitive Poems. It's been a long process. I've been trying to make my own series since about 2018 when I was a senior in high school, and it only took about three years for my first series in the past of yesterday to actually start releasing and come out. That was, oh no, I'm actually wrong, four years. It came out February of 2022. So what started you on your creative journey? I've always been in the drawing when I was a kid. I first got my first comic book was Ultimate Spider-Man, although I was two and I didn't read the words. I had the I had like 37, 8, and 9. I think that was right after the first movie, and there was a bit of a lull. And then I started picking it back up in the 50s or reading the pictures. But I didn't start attention to comics until 2012 when I went from Ultimate Spider-Man to The Walking Dead. That's a heck of a jump from superheroes to super zombies. Yeah, I don't think I should have been reading it at that time. <laughs> well, I mean, still, two two very good series and comics to get into. It. Tell us about Exodus from Paradise in the past of yesterday. So the log line for the story is that um, with the murder of high school senior Macy Stevens, the true depths of corruption and power surrounding her death reveals itself. It's essentially not a murder mystery, where it's not like a who done it's more of uh going back for these characters iris salazar and deus carter going back to the past months and trying to figure out what led up to macy's death and how things just didn't seem right about it it almost sounds like it has similar a uh, similar feel to uh 13 reasons why yeah that comparison is kind of fair although no 13 reasons why it came out in like mid 2010s i think maybe because i started this idea in 2018 as well as just like it was supposed to be like a little animated short, but I kind of had to put it on the back burner as I started college at the time. And when I started my next project from the sea, like for the for like over a year, I had like, okay, I got like these pages done, but now the story and art isn't just working. So I'd restart it. Then same thing, restart it. I thought I need a smaller project to work on, but what do I have back here? And in mid 2021, I whipped up a script quickly and started the art in august what's the genre of this particular series how do you how would you classify it it's a bit of a mystery drama there's some dramatic elements with character interactions and big reveals and such that most of my work manages in a way to all be dramatic so what is the most misunderstood aspect about the mystery drama genres that people who don't follow them misunderstand Honestly, I'm not really sure because I'm just a tourist to this kind of genre. I'm not, I don't know any of the big mainstays, the big stories. I'm just here doing my own thing. Curious about your, your insight into that. Not a problem. Eh? I always find this, this fascinating. Those that can write, draw, and, and create their comics as well. What is it about makes you excited for creating the series? The thing that most interested me and when I finally got the volume three for Containment Breach is just having a physical book. That's kind of like, the main drive that started me when I was younger, like, wow, I have all these creators and having their own books. I want to have that someday. And that's what kind of drives me after all the uh, trouble with indie plan and trying to get books listed on there. I just had to switch to Amazon. And now that people can actually buy it for themselves is just something that's so crazy to me now. It's great to see that you have, something on amazon as well too not many people can say that they have a book on amazon to be perfectly fair yeah what is it about 
being an artist and a writer that drives you creatively? Is it, does it energize you? Does it train you? Like, how does that output help you as a person? It drives me, but there's also a bit of a problem because it's 50% dedicated to writing and 50% dedicated to the art. When I was doing the story in Containment Breach, I could just do the art. I could just focus on that, and I didn't have to think about how the script would go, how I'd have to rewrite once I started typing the text on the page. I could just go wild with that. But here I just kind of have to temper how fast I can expect to get work done. I have a script, but that changes even when I'm typing and or putting in dialogue. I I think like 80% of my scripts are rewritten on the page. That goes to show that you're trying to make your story flow better and you, you see issues as you reread things and you're you're planning out your your stories as well too. So you're doing some project management as well. It's 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 a full time job. I can safely safely say that. Yeah, and whenever I write my scripts, I just write a script. I don't do like page one, panel one. This happens here. Like I have the general idea of what actions I want to happen, but I don't have a fleshed out uh, panel by panel breakdown. Which if I was writing for someone else, would probably not be good. But people work differently. Like if you're doing more of a, a film script format, you have a little more flow to work with and room to work with because you're still thinking visually in a film script type style, but you're at least putting it onto a comic page and that still gives you the flexibility to make more panels or less panels as you need to as you're editing and working on your, your story. Yeah, and then, well, I originally want to do film type stuff, so I guess that translated over here. It's just like you're putting together a shot list for a film, but just just putting it onto a comic book. I, I have a background in film as well, so I, I understand that. And not many uh, writers and, and script writers actually draw out their storyboards for their films. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Hmm. I haven't really spoken to many people yet to actually have any major advice, but this piece goes back when I was in high school. I For like my senior year, I did cross country. I'm starting to forget if I was the one that thought of this or if I was inspired, but my coach would always, I was the slowest one around since I was so new. And so just coach would like try to inspire me or just say like, just keep motivation. So the one piece of advice that I always keep in my mind is uh, I had it on my tip of my tongue and I forgot it was uh, don't think, just do. That's kind of kept with me. I don't really think too much about things. I just have to do and get it out there. To be proactive, not reactive. Yeah. Yes. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, I don't think I've actually had any realizations like that it's just something i never really thought of like yeah in history words have inspired groups of people but in terms of like things that have been relevant in my life just nothing really has been around there yeah I and mean, if it helps i'm like i don't know if i'm i'm probably not the youngest i'm only 23 so i haven't really had too many major things happen yet and especially since we've been locked down, for, I've kind of no different than when I was in 2020. It's a comfort zone thing as well, too. It's like we're, we're used to a set, uh, a set path. We're used to a set routine. And, you know, we, want, we don't want to really deviate from what's made us comfortable and what's made us creative and successful. So I can understand that for sure. And looking at this, this series here as well, too, you've written, you said, three volumes now? The best example I can give for this series is for my uh, anime and manga fans is like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure with mm -hmm. each part having its own story or for the MCU fans, each part is its own movie. Okay. What was the hardest scene for you to write and draw? Hmm, the hardest scene. I say I don't really have too many complicated pages. I'm what, so I, I do a lot of like over the head shots with, uh, lots of uh, uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Like there's this one scene in the first page of chapter three where it's inside of a quick trip gas station. 
I'd, before, I'd say that's one of my most complicated pages, but that actually just got topped by a page for an extra chapter that I'm doing called The Summer Connection. That's as of uh, June 24th is publishing on Comic Fury. But I just did a – is there a golf land over there in the east, Gulfland Sunsplash? Okay, well, over here in the west, we have this place called Gulfland Sunsplash, and the whole chapter takes place at a water park. The perspective shot, I have to say it takes took about just under 20 hours to draw. It is one of the most complicated pages I've ever drawn. It I used to I, I never completed the uh, perspective assignment when I was in college, never thinking I'd need it that much until now. But when I do compl complicated shots like that or just talking pages, I feel like trying to keep a balance between interesting and pleasing for the talking pages versus the uh, complex structures of perspectives to be hard to balance sometimes. Yeah, I uh, I did one in when I went back to university for visual arts and film um, where I had to do a perspective shot of a baseball diamond from like a thousand feet in the air or something like that. All you're going to see are dots and shadows. Like, is that interesting? And the teacher's like, yeah, you, you have to understand this stuff. I'm like, okay. Turned out all right. But, you know, it was it was difficult. Like, you, you never really think in three-dimensional, like, as much as you'd like to do. And I think that's what makes comics interesting as well, too, where you're trying to find your own depth of field for your characters and in that space. Even though a comic panel is, is two-dimensional, how are you understanding th the three-dimensional aspect when you're writing and drawing? I've tried to look at um, original manga art pages, like seeing like how the artists and assistants, all their strokes and marks on the paper, because a lot of the, a lot of manga art, the backgrounds is so detailed and intricate. It al it's almost realistic and just how they apply to like screen tones and all that just to make believable city or uh forest scene and i just can't figure out how they do it like i know they trace and stuff but figure out where to lay down the blacks trying to dial back on the hatching big strokes small strokes it's just something i'm still trying to figure out myself i think it comes with practice and while you're working within a panel itself you know, try to figure where your floor is as a starting point and figure your character's angles as well, too. I think that's something that a lot of people still focus on, like either a front shot or a side shot. They don't really work on three quarters or anything like that uh, as much as they, they probably could because of just, I think, the way the angle of the body is and, and face. It just comes back to what, what you're trying to accomplish. And you've seen Walking Dead and, and you've seen the Spider-Mans and all that stuff. And while those are more sometimes more exaggerated poses, sometimes a simple matter of changing the shading in the background will give you enough depth to work with, I think. Yeah, I'm definitely trying to uh, figure out how Charlie Adler knows like, okay, I'm going to make this whole scene black while keeping like a light on this window or this shine in here. It's just something I'm still trying to figure out with just heavy spots of black. Less is more sometimes also works out well too. If you find that you're putting too much black into a page or too much shadow into a page and it's taking away from what you're trying to create, maybe putting like a, a, a block or a paper or something over that character layer. Are you doing this digitally or are you doing this traditionally? How are you working? Traditionally. I've seen some of the, the masters of Marvel and DC as well, too, as the, the manga artists. If you put like just a piece of white paper over me, over top of your character and work around it, or at least a, a cutout of your character, then you're not touching into what you're actually drawing and creating. And that way it gives you that separation you need. And maybe that outline is a little larger than your character. So you have a white, a white silhouette of some kind, which will give you your separation too. something to try. <laughs> But you're the artist. I, I'm just the guy that did four years of it. So <laughs> you're more professionally accomplished than I am. You know, what's the most underappreciated manga or novel that that people should read? Ooh, underappreciated. Um, yeah. Underappreciated manga or novel. I can't really think of on top of my head. I don't really read books, but I haven't re I've mostly read all the popular 
Yeah, most of the stuff I read is popular, so. What are three manga or, or comics that people should read? Ooh, top three of that should read. This one's a bit subjective to people because they might get turned off because of how bizarre all the characters and events are, but one is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Going long and finally getting in part six publishing and Viz took them years. Uh, another one, the other one that's inspired me was Attack on Titan. Mm. It, it's popular, but just the way the like a single event from like chapters and chapters ago can come back for a big reveal and then be for another reveal is just ingenious. And then the third, mm, I'd mm, for a comic, not a manga, I'd say well, Walking Dead. That's one that's always. Oh, no, not The Walking Dead. Deadly Class. Deadly Class by Wes Craig and Rick Remender. Wes Craig in that book is like absolutely amazing. He was, he helped inspire my process in making comics when I, because I got the uh, hardcover deluxe editions with like the little extra material in the back. And just, just from seeing how his process was in that back of that book and how his process is on Instagram, I kind of, taken and inspired and just it helped it helps me draw my pages to too what is it about his style that that you really enjoy and that you're trying to improve on yourself personally just the way that he uses like negative space how there'll just be a panel of the character talking but the colorist will kind of fill it in and give it the rest of the life that it needs for the scene and i've kind of taken a step back with some backgrounds and not doing just background after background for each panel and just letting like the negative space breathe. Like with this previous chapter that I'm doing the summer connection, I hired a screen toner to come in and uh, put tones and gray over my art. And I left some panels open and just having someone come in and add to that, like the screen tones look absolutely amazing and just having someone fill in that negative space with something else. It, I, it makes sense to me why some, so many panels are left open in deadly class. That was a Netflix show as well too, right? Or am I thinking sci-fi and they canceled it. It was on Netflix for a little bit. I, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was really well done and that actually got me looking for the, the comic. Cause I thought this feels like a comic, you know? And it was. <laughs> what did you draw from to create the characters of your series? A lot of people draw from real life. When they write themselves, they draw from their own personal experiences. But me, I just kind of think of a character and thought, okay, they, they exist in this world and just go forward with it. I don't really, I've had, had been asked another question if I, I myself is in this character, but no, not really. Really, I mean, other characters, but in this particular one with Iris and Deus, not really. So they were interesting characters just to create. Yeah, they're interesting characters, but given that this story is only six chapters, it's not much to develop them. I mean, they go through some personal changes from the start to, I say, the midpoint, but they kind of stay a little stagnant beca because of that, because there isn't much to develop further than that. What are some of the themes that you, that formed when you started creating this series that you didn't realize appeared until after you completed one or two of your uh, issues? For In the Paths of Yesterday, it kind of came down to the, just a theme that people above let themselves run free with all the corruption and just taking advantage of other people. That's kind of a main theme going forward with this whole series overall down the line because even though it starts out as like a high school mystery at this point the further it goes on it's, it'll expand to something a little bit beyond that if that's a uh, at this point weird to try to visualize when i was in high school there were some things that i saw that i didn't like at all just nasty stories about a teacher that i knew not personally but i just knew we all knew of had something come out against them in like a couple years after we were gone. And we thought, 
Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And we just move on. Not so much we need account accountability. It's just we need to be more conscious of scummy people and just not think, oh, okay, and just move on. It's amazing how, you know, high school is just a, a blip in life. You know, it's four years or however long it is, depending on where you are. And what you make of it is what you make of it. And then you move on with your life and the connections you make are great. If, if you have friends that you've followed throughout the years and you've connected with throughout the years, but sometimes it's just a stop in the road. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Hmm. I, in my personal life, I don't really have anyone that inspires me. But in terms of works that I like, I have to say The Art of Wes Craig. Because that helped me when I started actually getting serious about this in 2019 when I read that Deadly class. And just after that, things just started falling into place and started to make sense. I still had a lot of things to learn from my own uh, experiences drawing and writing, but that helped me set the path to where I am now. From a professional standpoint, you have created your own comic series. It's on Amazon and it's doing well and you're on this show to promote it. And I do greatly appreciate you being on here. I'm sure there's more we could talk about as well too, but that just means you have to come back on in the future and, talk about your series and anything else you decide to create. So please come back on at any time. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Personally? Yeah, I've finished my first series. I got a product people can buy, but just in terms of outside success, like getting more recognition, it's, hit or miss i've only been accepted for one anthology which is containment breach and just everything else i've been denied from denied submission stuff so i kind of switch if i'm actually successful to in there with the rest of people just creating things in terms of personal success yeah i've hit my goals i was in a, an anthology i have my book out for people to buy all that is just i've got what i want but we always want a little more. My traffic to my website is pretty decent, but not 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 breaking numbers. All my social medias are stagnant, no matter how much I try because those algorithms. So I'm successful enough to apply for an interview like like this and beyond. So just to get get me out there. So yeah, I've hit all my all the goals that I wanted, but we always want more. So there's always room to ex to improve and expand, and that's what we tried to make every day of the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures well i've certainly had a lot of uh rejected submissions so i'm fine with them it's kind of a annoyance when like i send something out like in february and then four months later waiting all that time and then no you sorry we didn't accept it it's like uh and a lot of these opportunities are take a lot to show up. So it, it's a little bit not disappointing. I'm not going to go with that negative. It's just not a, not an annoyance, but it's not, I, I wouldn't say completely frustrating. It's just a little bit kicked to it. Yeah, but that's, too, it's not negative because I'm not mad at these people. It's the creative process. You're going to get rejected. It happens, unfortunately. Yeah. You have to deal with it. That's that's the lumps we take. I'm fine with it. It's just waiting months only to be told no. And the last one I was, I didn't even get an email. She said on Twitter, she's like, oh, message me if you didn't get a response. I did. Still no. Second last question is this. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, artist, or everything all together as you are, maybe you've inspired them down that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, we have a lot of problem with creatives showing their personalities online in just negative ways. I try to keep mostly to myself. I have a few things to say about media that I like, but I try to stay quiet and just be in my own corner and just let people, let my work speak for itself. 
And it's all about not letting your personality get to you. I'm really just a quiet guy normally. But even when I started getting like my first comment, I already started to feel like, oh, I was able to put this work out and people can see it. That's not me. I can understand the uh, imposter syndrome effect. And I just think that when you put yourself out there, you got to put the self that put yourself that you want other people to see. You don't want to be a nasty person and have that people just pile on to you because of that. And so just for all these creatives out there, just be good. If your life was a comic or a manga, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Mm. When I was in high school, I used to listen to a lot of uh, 60s rock and 90s rock. But recently, I've kind of been going into more like digital stuff like synth wave, vapor wave, chill wave, mostly because they just like how it sounds. So it'd probably have like an electronic soundtrack like that. And for a title, my life's not really too exciting. So probably something as simple as uh, the journals of my name or something. That's the most basic thing I can think of. Well, Chase, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find this on Amazon and uh, anything else you'd like to promote? On social medias, you can find me at, at underscore Chaz underscore Bernard underscore on both Instagram and Twitter. And from there, you can get links to both where my comic is and where my listing on Amazon is. So instead of going to Amazon and searching for all these things, you can just go to my social media and it's just all right there. Currently on Comic Theory and Global Comics, the extra chapter, The Summer Connection, is publishing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. After that, there'll be a mini break. And then part two from the sea will start on August 2nd. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number. Totally different website. You don't want to go there. And you can find this on our YouTube channel because that's way more updated than our website because, you know, YouTube has their own servers. It's youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your favorite podcast streaming services that you listen to and it'll be there. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.